welcome to this week's edition of Inter-University Debates. Uh, for this week, we are excited to host one of the universities that made it to the quarterfinals, and that is Mbara University of Science and Technology, and that is MAST. Uh, we congratulate them for having made it to the quarterfinals of the debate. There are other universities as well that made it to the quarterfinals, and those are Makere University, Kabale University, Islamic University in Uganda, Uganda Pentecostal University, Makere University Business School, Kampala International University, Mkumba University, Uganda Christian University, Avendish University, and Usitema University. I'm your host for today's debate. My name is Nakei Jenda Fancy. I'm an advocate, I'm a lecturer, and a tax consultant. I'm very excited to host um, Barra University of Science and Technology, having made it to the quarterfinals uh, after a very hot inter-university debate. And today's topic is one that is very, very, very interesting. And before we get into it, um, this debate is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance, and that is CCG, uh, together with uh, Civic Space TV. And it airs every Thursday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Civic Space TV on YouTube. Our topic for today is um, digital rights, emerging technologies, and climate justice. What is the role of the youth in all this? And this is a very interesting topic, and it is something that has been discussed uh, globally as well as nationally. Uh, it, it has been before uh, international organizations like United Nations. And today, students of um, Barra University of Science and Technology are going to unpack and debate this topic. I would like to go straight away and introduce the debaters for today. I'm going to start right from um, the one who uh, represented Barra University of Science and Technology during the inter-university debate um, and led um, Mbara University of Science and Technology to qualify for the quarterfinals. And that is none other than Mutungisa uh, Edgar. Edgar, you're welcome to reintroduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dureta Jenda. Uh, I'm Edgar Mutungisa uh, from Mbara University of Science and Technology, where I'm a student of Petroleum Engineering and Environmental Management. And uh, a former Minister of Justice and, and Constitutional Affairs uh, for Federal Guild Council. And of course, because I do petroleum engineering and environmental management, as I had notified, uh, that has been my excitement to discuss climate justice, especially, and all of youth to that end. And um, I'm really so glad and looking forward to an amazing discussion, especially when it's a digital rights, given the digital age we're in uh, uh, currently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar. We are happy to have you, and we are glad that you're going to debate this topic, um, especially uh, climate justice, since it uh, rhymes directly with your course. Our second debater for today uh, is called Ricky Mugume. Ricky, you're welcome to reintroduce yourself. Okay, my name is Ricky Mugume Kashija. I'm a physiotherapy student from Bar University of Science and Technology. Um, currently, um, I think I'm in my third year, yes, and uh, it's really interesting. Now, the topic at hand today is quite an interesting topic and one that I'm very excited to discuss with you. And I hope everyone is engaged with what we have to say today. Otherwise, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ricky, and we are happy to have you. Our third debater from uh, from Mara University of Science and Technology. Today is Miss Nakulima Denise Madrin. Madrin, you're welcome. All right, once again, a good afternoon to you all. My name is Nakulima Denise Madrin, a third year biomedical engineering student at Mara University of Science and Technology. And I've never been more excited to engage in this particular topic of discussion today because it has a dear place in my heart. I'm passionate about climate justice and the entirety of the topic. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, 
Madin, uh, we are happy to have you for today's debate. Uh, last but not least, we have our fourth debater, and that is Okelo Jerome. Jerome, you're welcome to uh, reintroduce yourself. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, by the name is Okelo Jerome. I am a second year student at Mbara University Science of Technology. I'm doing a Bachelor in Science in Accounting and Finance. Uh, I'm very humbled and pleased to be part of this panel that is going to discuss a topic that so dearly I'm an activist in uh, digital rights, emerging technologies, and uh, climate climate justice. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Jerome, Jerome, we are happy to have you. We, we are praying that your your network stabilizes um, so that we can uh, properly. Um, understand you when the debate starts. So um, I'm glad to have these four panelists for today. And uh, as Ali has stated, our topic at hand for today is digital rights, emerging technologies, and climate justice. What is the role of the youth? So I would like us to go straight into the discussion for today. And we will start by giving our introductory remarks. I will start with the first panelist, and that is Edgar. So Edgar, you're welcome to give your introductory uh, statement for today's debate. And I would like you to feature uh, what you understand by digital rights in your introductory uh, statement. Edgar, you're welcome. Okay, I thank you so much. Uh, so every time I think we talk about digital rights, uh, ideally it is just, um, the, the rights that are human, but also ones that are, could be enshrined within our constitution, uh, so within the legal framework that allow individuals to be able to enjoy digital media. That is to say they can enjoy its creation, they can enjoy how they access it, uh, how they publish it, and, and all that. So that's what digital rights entail. And um, digital rights could uh, be categorized as different types. Uh, let's say they could also um, envision your freedom of expression and information, but most importantly, they could also factor into that your um, uh, your freedom of expression. What extent do you express yourself without necessarily causing like a hatred kind of environment, even when you're behind your computers? So that's what it rights entail. So ideally, I think what the discussion has been uh, globally, it has been so much on how to um, ensure cyber security uh, and also most likely on how to give people a safe space uh, because there have been many cases where people have reportedly uh, are told, uh, 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 indicated on how they have been so much threatened, you know, digitally, and they have been so much uh, threatened on virtual platforms. I talk about the, the recent incident with Metaverse of, of sexual harassment and many others. But also, digital rights is going to, I think for today's debate is going to be, um, uh, it, it, it's going to be more interesting because for special cases like of Uganda, we are going to have so much to weigh into the principle versus the reality on the ground. Because uh, I think for the cases like Uganda, it's a very special case. And I think maybe we're going to dive into more into that later. Uh, but the whole picture is that in a space like Uganda, where you have, uh, for instance, having a computer misuse act, it has been um, uh, there for years, but yet there's been so many reports on how people feel that only the state has weaponized it against the uh, entire population while using it to its advantage. So there could be queries of whether we actually need more digital rights or whether the ones that are existing are sufficient. And if not, what could be the solution? Such kind of, of, of questions will have to be resolved. I think that's what I can say uh, ideally about the digital rights as a well. whole. Okay, thank you so much, Edgar. We surely will get into um, that discussion about uh, digital rights at a later stage, and you will start from there. But for now, let us move to Ricky. Um, and uh, Ricky, I would like to bring you into the discussion and allow you to give your introductory remarks. And I would like you to feature what you understand by emerging technologies. Uh, you have the floor, Ricky. Thank you so much, Mr. Edgar, and thank you so much, Ms. Fancy. Using technologies is quite a perspective, also an IT perspective. From my IT perspective, 
we are looking at technologies that are changing the world, not even just in the health profession, worldwide scale. How do we produce the products we are having today? Uganda has joined the level its own production. The point that now we are now making our own products. People can produce their own oil. People can produce their own soap and get soap is exorbitantly expensive today. People are at the level of actually the idea of importing. Yet we still have to buy these things at a very, very expensive price. And at the same time, when you go down to the health center itself has been technology um, like we are inputting technology in how we treat our patients to assess the patients, which I is our education and the emerging technologies as a way forward, because this is an inevitable portion of society. Technology is something we have to deal with now, and it's not going to go away, and it's going to keep advancing and changing. The question is, are we ready to change with it, or are we going to wait for it? Um, are we going to stay behind as the whole world advances upon us? Now, that is a question we all ought to deal with. Otherwise, I'm very happy to be part of this discussion and elaborate more as we go. Okay, thank you so much, Ricky. Um, just like for digital rights, we will also have um, that discussion about emerging technologies at a later stage. Let me welcome Margin. And Margin, it's time for you to give us your introductory remarks. And... Uh, Please feature what you understand by climate justice in your introductory remarks. So when you talk about climate justice, you know, this is a term that is quite broad, but at least entails some of the basic things that for over the years throughout our primary we have had being preached. Things like ensuring that I environment, envir like reducing on the adverse changes of the environment, like the climatic change. And also secondly, ensuring that the, the burden of preserving and conserving the environment is shifted from what we would call the small bit, but then we are looking at, we are envisioning a bigger crowd, we are looking at things like engaging communities, and furthermore, this narrows down to addressing the impacts of the climatic change, what I would call the adverse effects on some of the, you know, the already burdened groups, by this we can talk about as people here in the developing countries, you can talk about such marginalized groups. So at the end of the day, this is a very interesting conversation that we can choose to have right now, because at the end of the day, it looks at how we can potentially, us as the youths, uh, bridge this gap and look to better and give solutions and engage in things that can actually better the climate, the climate of our countries and, you know, globally at large. Uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you, uh, Madrin, uh, for your for that introduction. Uh, let me move to Jerome. So, Jerome, let us go into the discussion about digital rights at this point. And my question to you, as you give us your uh, introductory remarks, is: What is the current uh, status quo? in Uganda in, uh, when it comes to digital rights? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, before I go to the current status quo that is uh, in Uganda um, involving the digital rights, uh, to me, I feel like our digital rights and emerging technologies as well as our climate justice is going to be a way for us to incorporate ourselves uh, with the emerging technologies. We are going to have to look at the things that have that are being coming that are coming up drastically that are going to enable us to uh, fight climate change that is occurring throughout the world currently and uh, in our current status quo with our digital rights we are faced in uganda particularly uh, we are faced with a lot of uh, cyber cyber insecurity we're left with uh, a lot of pri privacy uh, rules breakage and also indiscriminative freedom broken by by people the government themselves and uh, individuals and that. okay uh, thank you jerome that is uh, the current status of digital rights uh, according to him let me bring edgar into the discussion so edgar earlier you actually opened this discussion about digital rights 
And um, I remember clearly you had started on mentioning some of the laws. And my question to you is related to that. Uh, what is the current and legal framework on digital rights in Uganda? Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much. I think to that question, um, uh, 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 on, on my take on how the current uh, digital framework is, and the law on that, I would say uh, we do have the law that exists. We have the Computer Misuse Act. I don't remember the year whether 2006, but at least I know it exists. But I also most likely note that uh, it is as good as one that does not exist. So I think then the question to me would be whether that law should be scrapped off or whether it needs to be implemented, which I think ought to be implemented uh, because we've seen on various occasions where the state uses the Computer Misuse Act to go against this certain section of people that have only gone against the government and specifically only the first family. I think uh, some of you have been watching debates. You remember there was a debate where uh, Council Semakade and, and was passing some MP, you know, and it was a debate on such an issue on why Computer Misuse Act, the only times where it has been sufficiently applied is by the state and not by a civilian or like in favor of a civilian, but only by the state against civilians. So I think then the state of the digital rights uh, legally also then, uh, then become a little uh, a problematic, especially for our legal framework. Um, yeah, so, but also that is to say that we also need to recognize that um, th this legal framework, I think to me, uh, uh, it, it's still lacking with so, so very many basics. For instance, um, one is, is, is in that idea of applicability. But number two, I don't think there's even much knowledge from the populace about that kind of act. But then number three, I think that Computer Misuse Act is a little ambiguous in many ways. Like for instance, um, when you talk about uh, like content, you know, that ought to be, I, I don't think there can be any content that can be linear to say uh, that it would be accepted by people and everyone must be comfortable with it, right? Because we need to distinguish also, like the, it, it's very hard to draw a line between what your right to of, of expression is um, vis a vis what um, you need to do to stop hatred. So when people speak sometimes bitter facts that you do not necessarily you accept about yourself and it's the ultimate truth, but then you consider it as something that you find um, not comfortable and then you go ahead and persecute them. That's because you have power, because you have the state. So I think there is that kind of badger that uh, is happening. I really think the state of our, of our legal rights, especially digital rights, is really a nice one. Okay, um, thank you, Edgar. Um, let me move to Ricky. Ricky, I would like you to start right from where Edgar stopped. So when it comes to digital rights, Edgar gave um, a bit of its uh, legal framework and he talked about the Computer Misuse Act that is of 2011. And as we know, the constitution does not make uh, this right non-derogable. So that means this right can be limited. And my question to you is that, um, do you think it is justifiable to limit digital rights? Um, Jenda, how are you? Uh, thank you so much, Edgar. I'd like to be part of digital information or limitation of digital rights can be two-sided. One, it is a way of protection both citizens and the state. But then in another perspective, digital rights lim uh, limitation is another way that is very undemocratic coming from the state. Because one of the things is that law of information should be at no cost. Because one of the ways we've seen that people have very much developed themselves through this flow of information, through the sharing and advancing of ideas that are very crucial to the development of our country. We prize ourselves as a country um, in our agricultural systems, yet we are one of the countries with the most archaic methods of agriculture. Now, how are we going to advance if the people themselves are not allowed to have this information? We've seen that means is no, no longer a problem because I'm thinking about 75% of our population owns a smartphone, or at least the adult population owns a smartphone. And even if they might not know how to use it, they are within the vicinity of someone who can. Therefore, the government limiting 
digital rights in a way of limiting internet or increasing the price and taxation of internet. That means that people are being denied the, uh, the access to this information that is necessary to develop us as individuals and also necessary to develop us as a country. Now, at a broader perspective, digital rights ought to be clarified to the public. It's no longer um, a matter of professionals or people of uh, some type of good education knowing this and that without actually pushing down this information to the public to understand what are these digital rights. And secondly, what, what criteria are they following to limit, this, uh, to limit the digital rights towards the people who need this type of information? We are no longer a country that um, was backwards in a way of understanding um, advancement. We are now a studied country. And that is one of the things that government refuses to recognize, that people are now more evolved in their understanding and their way of approach to life. And therefore, giving just the digital rights, or rather not limiting these digital rights towards the people, is another way of giving them protection to understand what the world holds. Because you do not expect, it's like, um, I, can, I can liken this to our education system teaching us things that are not necessarily applicable to the world outside education or outside school. And therefore, you find yourself that you've not been prepared enough for what is out there. So the government, in a way, is asking us that we've limited this information or we've limited this digital rights, but at the same time, they expect us to function at the rate at which our competitors, our neighbors are functioning, knowing that our neighbors are well exposed, our neighbors are well studied, and our neighbors are well facilitated in ways of digital rights. I think it is very wrong for the state to masquerade the idea of protection under their guise of limiting information flow, and I think that should be my take. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ricky. Um, let me bring Madrin into this discussion. So, Madrin, you, you, we have all listened to Ricky's submission on the, whether the state is justified in limiting um, digital rights. And my question to you is, do you agree with Ricky? And uh, that, that, that question has uh, another question attached to it, is, which is that how do we deal with issues of uh, cyber harassment, cyber crimes, um, and and uh, child pornography. How do we deal with some of these issues in in a situation where we are discussing uh, not limiting digital rights? Uh, definitely, I would agree with Ricky on what he has said. Because when it comes to limiting, then the then the especially from the state, then that brings us to a very important question: that what will be the measure of limitation? And really, giving the state. That is already that already has some sort of power and leverage to limit what is out there. Then would be kind of a challenging thing, because then the measure of what is right or what is offensive to the state then will come in. So really, giving them that power would be a disservice. So then going to the second question, which you have asked me, how are they? How are we then going to deal with things like cyber harassment and pornography? Well, when it comes to that, that is quite an interesting thing that we should engage in because the limitations to all these things for starters is we lack a clear sort of guideline or what I would call rules and regulations to, that are explicitly stated somewhere to guide us through the whole usage. So then that leaves a population that has ventured in this new thing technology and having smartphones, you know, that leaves them there to explore it the way they want. So in a, in, in a moment that, first of all, we failed to guide these people on how to play around this thing, which they are now enjoying and getting used to, then that is a, that at that particular moment that things become quite tricky. But well, we know that things like cyber hacking or pornography are known things that we should advocate for. But then that goes back to the drawing table. As like that goes back to the drawing table. Well, if the government would wish to do all these certain things, that goes back to the drawing table and we have to address matters like how best can we 
bridge this thing. Maybe what if we let the population know about this whole entire internet thing or its usage and how they can better, like better it in a quite positive way or productive way. Because there are some things that you can never 100% cannot be eliminated. Yes, like things like, you know, the cyber hardness and stuff. But then what if you gave these people the right tools that can at least put them on a 70% of how best they can utilize the internet or how best they can utilize these social media platforms? I think that would put them in a better place than to decide on what content that they are putting up there. But at the point where this has failed and no clear rules and regulations or guidelines have been put in place, then the discussion of, of limitation or the discussion of restriction is not one we should have because we are coming from a point where these people haven't been informed of what to do. So that leaves us at a dream point that the better way to maybe play around this is to address it from the basics. So let us give people, like, you know, how best can you utilize this? If this information is out there and people can source it, that can put them in a better position to make better decisions. But otherwise, it's quite wrong if you don't teach a child how to, you know, mob and then you come and beat them for mobbing the room badly. So that goes back to the entire thing that the government really in this particular point in time shouldn't have the power to limit, to put restrictions on what is out there, unless they are willing to tell us the better guidelines and how we can use this, but they can't wake up one day and decide this should be put in place. Thank you very much. That is my submission of that. Okay, Madrin, before I let you go, um, in your discussion, you said uh, government should, before bringing out limitations, should um, instead teach the citizens on how best to utilize these platforms. And I would like to throw that question back to you um, since uh, we are discussing this right now. So how best do you think uh, the uh, digital rights can be utilized while protecting the citizens from things such as sexual, uh, I mean, um, not sexual harassment, cyber harassment, um, things like uh, cyber crimes, uh, child pornography, and, and so forth? So I think when it comes to the question of how best can the citizens utilize the internet in the same way as they are, you know, as in what I would call as the, in the right sort of usage or space, in the safe space of his need. You know, it all goes back to what you consider out there, like how, what is the content you're putting out there for starters? You know, at the end of the day, any action has an equal reaction. So this goes back to, if I'm sitting right here, what do I feel like putting maybe on my page or putting out there for someone else to access. You know, the question of justification is quite a tricky one because everyone will feel their content is kind of justified. But then if we understand that for every action you do, you're willing to take what I would call the equal reaction, then I think every citizen would then be in a, in, like in a point of a stable stage to be accountable for everything they put out there. Well, it's, you know, as we all have a different ways to put out the sort of information we want, then I think how best can this citizen do it? You know, it starts with what, it starts with what sort of, let me say like basic, what sort of content has been out there? Like if someone keeps on seeing this thing, let me say that is offending someone being put out there, and maybe they are not in a position to think about what the aftermath of what is going to happen. But what if these very citizens would, would be in a position before posting these things, think about the aftermath of putting out this sort of content, then at the end of the day, they will reconsider on everything they're willing to put out. And secondly, if the content is quite pleasant to majority of people, then at the end of the day, you're quite protected from things like cyber, cyber harassment, such, such what I would call the downsides of this whole interesting thing that we call the internet. So at the end of the day, these citizens, if they were in an informed point of view, and well, they have ventured in some of the ways on how they can use the internet in a good way and productive way, trust me, then they would know that if I, put, if I do this, this is what is going to happen in return. And if someone is, 
has this sort of information at their disposal, trust me, at the end of the day, they are going to put out content there that is protecting themselves or they, they don't want to put themselves into the eye of such, like into the eye of what I would call like the dear consequences of the internet, like say harassment, then they will be considerate enough to know that if I do this, this is going to, this is what is going to happen. So if they mind, first of all, and they are accountable for they put out there, then secondly, they can protect their own rights and the rights of others. Okay, um, thank you so much, Madrin, for that. Let me move to Jerome. So Jerome, as you know, our topic on digital rights uh, as well uh, talks about the youth. So I would like to ask you this question. So what role uh, can the youth play in protection of digital rights? Uh, thank you. Uh, now, since our topic is going to be generally uh, on the role that we, the youth, can generalize in the digital rights freedom and uh, and how to protect them. Uh, our greatest role that we have is to protect those rights, change the ones that do not, change the ones that do not uh, instigate what we need, and then bring about uh, bring about a singularity point of view. Uh, I'll use it in a point of view like. The report given by unwanted witness giving in, in their report on what the digital rights of uganda they, they talked about build to build on the existing knowledge uh, about digital rights and uh, internet governance in uganda we the youth can then use that kind of information like like we unwanted witness wanted it like to give more information about the internet use as denise had said earlier Show them the show show them the relevance of how we should use the internet. Give them that access that we can use the internet. Uh, technically, we as youth right now, I know we have very very methods of accessing internet. We have people even computer students who can code, who can code and actually gain any access to information. However much restricted we are, they will still get that information. Ha, now we are the youth. Imagine if we if we were given the relevance or the chance to stop uh we were given the chance to access that kind of information we, we are not we are not restricted we are not even restricted on cost or restricted on that we can actually protect those rights because we know what those rights entail because the rights involve there is one the digital rights involve human rights and legal legal rights uh there is uh internet access uh, access to information and uh, privacy and protection and uh, also rights for the marginalized groups and people if we knew exactly if we knew exactly what those rights entailed uh if we knew exactly what those rights entailed would actually do more in protecting those rights and since we lack in that information is what we now we as the youth can now come in to strive to protect uh let's say i i i know the i know the digital rights what they entail and what and why and why we are we are supposed to uh, aggrandize on them i would pass it to a friend and tell them that if you're using information you know that they're not supposed to do this and that basing on the fact that if i'm um, if i if i access this kind of information and it's going to be disastrous to the government or to other people then it's best you don't use it because this kind of law or this kind of infringement will dist will disrupt you our role is to help in passing on that information within the digital rights if we are to protect them. But we can't do that if we do not know even what our rights are, in what even the digital rights are. Because it's very, very, very funny that I go to, I go to understand uh, what digital rights are one year back when I was surfing through internet. And that's when I found out that we have, oh, we have digital rights. Then Uganda actually has digital rights. And then the news may have been talking about more about cyber, cyber harassment and how they're going to do it using the Ministry of, Info, of Information and all. But it doesn't, but not everyone within the sectors or the different parts of Uganda know even what the rights are. They do not even in, they do not know what they are. We should have that info. Now we as our role, let's say Edgar is there, uh, Denise is here, even you yourself are uh, lucky. You can actually use that information and spread it to other to other people and tell them that this is this is what uh, this is 
this is what is entailed within the information you're using or the internet that you're using because they assume that we the youth have we have more access and we have more information to re, in relation to use of internet to use of digital kind of uh, to use of emerging technologies and to use of all the technologies that are advancing towards the world and since the uh, elders have that perspective that we have that information let us then be the standing ground or the standpoint towards protecting the digital rights that are already there and reform the ones that do not and reform the ones that do not uh do not re- necessarily regard to what we are understanding the digital right. Thank you. Okay, um, let me, thank you, Jero. Let me move back to Edda. So Edda, we are talking about the youth and uh, digital rights. We are saying, let us protect digital rights. My question to you is, to what extent are the youth using their digital rights to be productive? Okay, um, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, and before I come to a question of to what extent are the youth using the digital rights to be productive, I would like to also comment on the past questions of, of the justification of, 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 of that limitation and how the government can avoid sexual harassment and, and, and all that. Could that be fine? Yes, please do. Yeah, because um, so to me, I don't think it is justifiable for you to limit digital rights because principally, I think there ought to be true reasons or circumstances um, under which we uh, can have those limitations. One is if there's any public interest that the government is protecting, which in this case, I don't see any public interest that uh, this Computer Misuse Act and then uh, all those things are going to be protected. I mean, when you when you limit, for instance, as according to, uh, I think, at, at sections 24 and, and 25 that talk about how you shouldn't disturb someone's peace in DTC, the fact that those questions are ambiguous themselves, even, you know, like they're just so subjective that they don't guarantee anything to limit a right of expression that our, that our constitution and rights. So to that end, there's no in the public interest you're protecting, but also there's no any violation on human rights that you are preventing. I think that's ought to be another condition under which you can limit a right. That is to say, if you are preventing a violation on any other human right, what we instead do when you limit digital rights, you instead violating the human rights to start with, because the digital rights ought to be uh, something that ought to be protected, right? But secondly, as I said about the law, remember we are dealing with uh, a, a computer misuse act that was challenged by the Ghana Law Society to start with. So that's how problematic it is in and of itself at the surface. And lastly, on how the government can avoid uh, cyber harassment and sexual harassment, I mean, uh, you know, uh, in terms of like child pornography, ETC. I think it's important to recognize that digital systems and digital rights and that digital environment is simply a product of people that live in this reality. That is to say that for as long as society still has, for instance, biases, of race, you know, uh, biases of gender, biases, you know, like in the normal society, then even the digital environment will have to portray those same systems. So the solution is not just to limit digital spaces when such things still happen on the physical environment, because the digital spaces are only productive in the physical environment. So I think that's how it has to go. So the same campaigns of feminism and ETC, of gender, uh, you know, of, of, of parities have to continuously happen for you then to have that kind of a good picture, even in the digital environment. Otherwise, you can't separate the two. And that brings me to the last question. I think that we need to address the idea of how um, other youth are uh, putting their digital rights and the environment to the right um, uh, functionality. I think youth are truly innovating because I can say with authority that we have seen, for instance, very many youth who are doing our businesses online. Um, we have seen youth who are voting uh, many different apps. Recently, uh, we had one about the Chikoni Shua app, I think, in my Makere University. So we can discuss whether it was really uh, productive or not. But I think that individual who creates it, perhaps you recognize the need in their society that they needed that dating app and ETC, right? So then the difference, therefore, and I think also beyond that, I think also youth are, are using the digital rights um, 
in terms of advocacy and governance beyond the other scientific innovations, but also we are seeing many youth who just get online and they're able to call out the president, tag him on Twitter, tag you know whoever they want on Twitter and, and, and be able to call them out if there's any kind of mistake uh, like in terms of their governance. So when, or when they feel they're being governed poorly. So I think to me, that's how youth are supposed to use addictive rights and they're doing it to a productive means. And there are actually been evident results that have come from such. So I think youth are, are really doing uh, well with addictive rights. So however, the question ought to be perhaps whether that is enough, whether they're doing enough, uh, which I don't think is the case, but also um, the problem then is not that they don't want to, but also the problem is because of the limitation that these guys are placing onto them. So as an activist who would like to write and use my, my power of um, perhaps of speech or of writing at, at, at to do my activism, I would be so scared in the current environment when I know Kakwenza was brutalized, right? So there is that kind of fear that is uh, that is state um, that, that is state supported, uh, but also you know the general thinking on the civic space that is becoming a very big problem. Yeah, but also beyond that, I think there is a problem with our kind of innovation that we are having digitally. That is to say that the Ghanaian youth, perhaps, uh, and specifically, are trying so much to um, be innovative. And as I said, there are very many kinds of apps and ETC they're trying to do. However, they have not been able to reach at that competitive stage where they can globally compete. Yeah, That, that is to say, for instance, if it's going to show up of materially, there's a competition with other dating sites that happen in the world, right? That is to say, um, if we have uh, this kind of, um, I think even for activism and data violence space, right? So there is that room where we have not yet fully, you know, um, uh, uh, put our, our uh, those apps there. So if you compare us with, uh, for instance, Jumia, with you know, and all that. So I think there's that big problem where we only innovate and come up with ideas uh, digitally, but then we only use the space for just visibility, but not a sustainable kind of uh, of gains uh, that uh, we, we do uh, actually get to have uh, from that kind of space. I think that's where the problem is. And I think that youth are truly innovating well uh, in these digital spaces. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Um, let me leave that discussion on digital rights there. So that concludes that discussion and we move to emerging technologies. And I'll let that discussion on emerging technologies kick right away. So with, with Ricky, so Ricky, you earlier on actually started on it by defining emerging technologies. And my question to you right now is, what is its current status in Uganda? Um, thank you so much, uh, Edgar, Denise, and Fancy. Um, before we imagine to the idea of the current status of emerging technology, I'd like to give a background to this topic, or at least my understanding of it. We look at the idea of emerging technologies as a way, way as for any, for any new to emerge, especially in this country, we have to credit the capabilities of the government in allowing people to progress in whichever way they can. Because one of the things we see is that our government has put up a lot of hindrances to innovation. And one of the things that we also cannot ignore is the type of hindrances the government has put. They are not necessarily direct. Most of them are indirect. For example, the taxation, of uh, internet, second, uh, information, third, the systems of education. These are all hindrances to innovation. But regardless of those technologies that are blowing us out of proportion, and uh, I would like to see some of the examples that I use. Let me use a very nice example. We have Jumia, we have uh, Safe Border, we have uh, the Cash App. Most of them are, are not necessarily local. But even those that are, are truly something to admire. I would like to start with one of the, I think, the most amazing that we've seen in um, the medical field. That is the app that has been developed by the Mbara University students of, um, of engineering school. These people have come up with an app that actually can help someone detect um, a heart attack or stroke. And most of these things have been available because of what 
people are willing to do regardless of their hindrances. And therefore, they are also going to be able to prosper if at all we are, allow, we, we are willing to let them publicize the work, this work and how we are benefiting from it. Are all people benefiting from our own citizens? One of the things that we need to look at with emerging technologies, especially local emerging technologies, is that most of them are hindered by the fact that most of the citizens, citizens are not willing to take on such projects as their own. They are not willing to use the products that are that are that have been produced from such emerging technologies. People are not trusting towards the capabilities of us as Ugandans, even as students, emerging technologies are within the populations of and 35 years of age. Usually we have not seen people beyond the age of 35 going out of their way to produce um, magnificent or actually problem-based emerging technologies. So what we need as a country mostly is the idea of problem-based technologies. I'll go back to something that Madrin had brought up earlier. The idea that in this country, how do we protect the people with each, with whichever, um, because I think it was discussed under the topic of digital rights, but it can also be discussed under the topic of emerging technologies. As she said, that with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, thanks to the physicists. But then still, uh, with each and emerging, uh, with each and every emerging technology, we are looking at a possible uh, benefit, and we are also looking at a possible cost, and whether uh, whether the people of this country, the government, the state, the individuals, the, the different bodies are willing to work or actually incur that cost. The cost might be financial, the cost might be social, the cost, the cost might even be psychological. Therefore, the government needs to come out, or whichever body the Ministry of Information and Technology needs to stand out and say, and discuss means unto which such emerging technologies can be regulated, can be facilitated as well. Because these are the people who are actually going to need facilitation in terms of resources, in terms of finances, and in terms of engineering of ideas. Because what we've seen in different countries is that the government actually import, import, um, very, or rather import ideas from different individuals who have actually qualified in these things. So are uh, our governments willing to actually help people who have come up with brilliant ideas to help them develop them to a scale where we can actually outsource that information to different countries? And is the government willing to be a center of excellence in terms of emerging technologies? Because one, we cannot have the ideas, and two, we cannot say that we have actually been set up by the different political that are hindering such progress. So we need to look at the idea of where do we stand as a country in terms of embracing emerging technologies because they are here, but are we willing to accept them? Secondly, are we willing to facilitate their growth as a country and as a state? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ricky. Uh, let me move to Madrin. So Madrin, I would like you to pick right from where uh, Ricky stopped, he posed the question of are we willing to invest in this uh, emerging technology? And my question to you is, do you think uh, technology is something that government should prioritize above other sectors? Definitely. Technology is one of the things that should be given high priority. You know, just like Ricky has said it, many of times with technology comes a lot of benefits like problem solving. You know, like us developing countries, I can, you know, we have a lot of things that we call challenges that actually if our government had prioritized and ventured in technology, majority of these problems would already been would have already been solved. You know that the entire problem that we have as let me say like many developing countries is the lack of priority. Majority of times our governments will tell us well and good, they want you 
you students, maybe you, I want you to be very you know, innovative. They will motivate you at the end of the day, put a few facilities, but the question still goes back to, are they willing to sustain you through this process? So that means one thing that as much as we would be very innovative, that would have the brain. Still, there's a missing piece of the puzzle, which is sustainability and priority and the consistency. At the end of the day, we are motivated to do all these things. But then where we lose it is, we are not at the level where our governments are willing to take us through, to walk that talk, take us through this process. Because if it's a child girl, you have to crawl and walk. We are not yet being taken through the entire process of walking. So at the end of the day, if you're preaching technology, let us grow in it, let us be with it, as it let us put infrastructure, let us put facilitations that can enable these people realize their technology rather their innovations. So this leads us to a point where if the government is really to if it was to put this into high, higher consideration, as in this would call for it to put into place things like what can I call them, like special facilitations? Because if it's a sector that is quite promising and advantageous, that we have the innovative brains, we have the young minds around that are actually very innovative, then where is the harm if we had a seat? As in, what if the government could say this is a sector I would wish to see somewhere and put in place all these necessary things? Of course, and many of times they have attempted to key start the actual process of motivating maybe these young people to come up with certain things like this. But at the end of the day, this entire process collapse, collapses because of the sustainability. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just more of a let us key start and leave it there. As in there's some sort of, you know, there's that missing piece of the puzzle that we have failed to feel. And but what if we could pull this piece of the puzzle? I and mean, that would be the very important thing. What if every year out there would desire to put a project and then the government, you know, says maybe this sort of project we are injecting, this we need money, as in let this be the talk we are preaching. People see this actual project, let me say it's a problem solving project being realized, then many of them are going to get motivated because they know I can make something to better my community. And it is going to be realized as if, if such things were put into place, then you know this is a very promising sector that we can actually harness because we already have the basic things that we need. We have the people who are already innovating. So what if we can just you know kiss at them and sustain them and make this a priority? Like as I think earlier in our discussion, they said we believe that agriculture is the backbone of Uganda, but look at what the look at the things we have in place that are actually going to be the agriculture. You know, that leaves a lot to be desired from our government and leaves a gap that is highlighted and our government should really address that if something is a priority, as you call it, then are you willing to kiss that it and let it flow? I think that is it for me. Okay, uh, thank you, Madrin, who says that um, in summary, it's, um, Technology is something that government should really um, Jerome into this discussion. So Jerome, uh, matter of this, this I press the button that government should invest in this sector. My question to you is: To what extent are the youth being uh, innovative and coming up with new technology right now? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, could I could I answer the question that you asked, Madrin, before the one of technology? The should government should that should government uh, prioritize technology above other sectors? Yes, please do. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, the two questions are going to be related, and I'm going to answer it in this kind of this kind of context. The government should daily prioritize uh, technology within the, what, what, what above other other kind of sectors. The basis the basis of stand is that. Technology in agriculture is going to improve on, agri on, on our production and GDP itself. Technology in the medical sector is going to improve on our sustainability to keep, be able to caterize and keep, be able to cater for all the medical people, all the, the patients that are in the different medical facilities, the x-rays, the heart, the, 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 the devices needed to perform surgeries and all other technical, technical, technical insertions in the medical field. 
you go to you go to the gender field it helps in it helps in information flow and passing out so the government should really actually really prioritize technology however it is the most the most uh, denied in all ways starting from the digital rights to the level of innovation and uh, and what right, and the freedom related towards the innovative in the innovative world so to answer the question to what extent are the youth uh, to what extent or the percentage at which the youth are innovative. Trust me, the youth are innovative to a percentage that even me, myself, I can't calculate. Uh, every day I'm seeing something new coming up. Every day I'm seeing something new trying to be devoted by someone because they have the ability to think and bring up an idea. It's the reason why we have a development of innovative village motive in Kampala. All those show that there is a level of innovation that the youth already have. They already, they already have that insignia to build up something. They're, they already have an, an, that insignia to work with the, the, the technologies that are already building up within themselves. Like the innovation stand that we already have is so high, high enough to a percentage that can actually build Uganda to uh, a level that can remove it from its third world state to a, maybe a second world state in, 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 a, in, a, case, in a case scenario. You take it that the, the the innovations that we have been bringing out, or even the status, the, the ideas that we keep, that the youth keep on bringing out within themselves, is a sign that they are trying to to build up with whatever they have. So, with what Madrina had said, however much we have this kind of innovative stand, because Uganda itself is generally innovative, it's an entrepreneurial country and it's an innovative country. Its mind is very, very vast. But as Madun had said, we are missing a puzzle. There's something we are missing out substantially. Our digital and free and innovative freedom is drastically under tight bottleneck. It is it is seriously under tight bottleneck that however much we are willing to innovate and build up something that is very substantially right for our country, Uganda, or for ourselves, there's no there's no there's no way that there's nothing that is there that is helping us prioritize to it. There's nothing that is helping us invest and maintain to it. And there's nothing that is going to help us take us through. Because when when we divide, when we decide to develop something new, and let's say, as Edgar said, I'm a, I'm a career student made up, built up an app. If if someone had a way to fund that app or a way to fund it in a way that could, could build it more further. It will encourage other people to develop more, 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 more in in this kind of state with the emerging technologies that are going out. However, if I'm coming under a lip tip kind of situation where you're going to take me to the TV, show me that I've innovated something, but there's no progress to that, then how am I going to innovate later on? However much motivated I am, there is a missing piece, as Denise had said, there's always that missing piece towards our development or towards the innovative culture that's really there. The culture is really there. It is actually very, very substantive and it's ready for the picking. However, is the government willing to take up that culture? No, they are put up a serious bottleneck onto the innovative freedom that we have. Thank you. Oh, okay, um, thank you, Jerome. Um, Edgar, I'll let you conclude on this topic emerging technologies before we move to climate justice. And uh, my question to you comes from solution part of our discussion. And it is uh, how best do we uh, promote? Yes, so my last question on this topic is to you, Edgar. And the question is that how best can we as a country promote uh, emerging technologies? Okay, <laughs> I think this is a good, very interesting question. It's more like maybe a charge question because our country needs a lot. So, but before that, I think one that we need to do is we need to contextualize that not every emerging technology is important for our country, for our nation. For instance, the current global emerging technologies are things like artificial intelligence, 5G, you know, blockchain, augmented virtual reality, and ETC. So truth is, if we get to search, we are most likely not going to compete. Beyond that, even to the most tangible things like cars, where we have our killer EV that has just for over years been dormant and our own leaders are not using it, but they're continuously uh, importing those from abroad. 
we still can't compete in a world where we already have autonomous vehicles being enrolled. In terms of war, we have autonomous weapons in Russia, Ukraine war that you've been seeing. So there are some spaces where we are so lagging behind that we can't just comp uh, compete in that light if it's just about income and, and, and maybe like economy. So just, just wasting our time. However, there are some spaces that define us, spaces like agriculture, that is our, book, that is our backbone. So I think we need to increase the kind of innovation, support innovation, inspire people to innovate. But beyond that, our country needs to uh, perhaps like, you know, uh, reflect that in the increase in the budgets for agriculture, but also do all those kind of processes that um, enhance and promote innovation in sectors like agriculture. But beyond that, we need to make sure that we have our agriculture to complete the entire chain of production not simply us continuously doing farming here and encouraging people to grow coffee for of which that coffee you're just going to export because should you keep on doing such a system then there will, there will never be need for emerging technology i mean what technology why should i even advance if the whole point is going to just continuously plant coffee but at a point where there are stages like of, of coffee production where you have factories being set up to have us produce refined, to be able to blend and brew that coffee up to when it's refined for use in hotels, then there would be opportunities within that line of production where people can innovate and solve and make easier. So you see, so these problems are systematic and not just about emerging technology. So the government has to first of all have this, it's, it's that lean and clean to that extent that we have um, complete uh, value systems and channel production so that we increase the gaps and opportunities under which we can innovate. But beyond that, it must be an innovation that is within our context, especially like agriculture, and not just like things of AI or virtual reality. I think if we went to do such kind of spheres, we are most likely not going to compete and yet we're not most likely going to advance and grow our economy. But beyond that, lastly, I think the key solution is to lead by example. I will repeat this. I can't wait for, for me to ever watch the president's convoy having killer EV as part of, 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 of that, right? I think that way we, shall, we are going to uh, have the best spirit of innovation, right? Because it doesn't make sense when you preach innovation on TV and, and organize galas and speak on radio. You can do whatever sensitization and it is that everyone here was talking about. You can tell people about the need to innovate. But for as long as people don't see that reality from their leaders uh, of you uh, using Bubu, but just simply perpetrating it on Twitter, they will never innovate. I mean, why would I even now, for instance, be so much interested perhaps in production of vehicles when I'm sure that Killer EV has not moved any step, right? So I think leading by example, if the government says uh, Bubu is the plan, then let us see it reflected within their own coffee at the state house. Let's not go to the state house and drink Nescafe when you have your coffee right here on the ground. Let you not see the president's vehicles all made from Germany and Japan and ETC when you have Kira EV just right here, right? So we think such kind of systems are ones that inspire innovation. And from them, then all the other kind of things will just come up automatically because young people will see opportunities uh, across the increased value chain of production. And beyond that, they will be able to trust that their um, innovation is going to be taken up and not just dropped because even the government, uh, 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 you know, practices that end. So I think that's what uh, can help us uh, generally uh, for us to be able to compete uh, in emerging technologies, but also to compete in the context that matches ours. Okay, uh, thank you, Edgar. And that concludes the discussion on uh, emerging technologies. And we'd like to move to something else and that is climate justice, which is the last part of our discussion for today. And I would like to start uh, with Ricky on that discussion. So Ricky, earlier on, we um, listened to the definition of climate justice from Madrin, and uh, I would like you to uh, proceed with, it, with that discussion. And my question to you is, where are we at right now as Uganda in terms of fulfilling our international obligations of promoting climate justice? Um, in all honesty, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to first thank 
margin for her definition. But in all honesty, we need to look at the idea that as a country, we have been we have been diverted from climate justice. And looking back at the past three years as we've been battling COVID-19, most of the country's efforts have actually been directed to the Ministry of Health and its endeavors to keep the Ugandan people free of COVID-19. How that is effective is yet to be debated, but the government in itself, the country in itself have been diverted from the idea of climate justice. And I think it should be said that if at all, I think we have gone back two or three steps back in the fight in the fight for climate justice. Because one of the things we should notice is that people relocated during uh, COVID-19 lockdowns. People actually went back to their hometowns. And how do you go back to a place where you don't own land? Obviously, you encroach on the land that is gazetted for specific purposes by the government. And those are the forests and the wildlife. Um, this was not even just seen in this country. We saw this in South Africa. And at the same time, we are looking at the idea that now people have cut down more trees because of the resources. A bag of charcoal in itself costs about, I think it's now close to 200,000 in this economy. And most people cannot afford 200,000. So what do we do? We go down and cut down the trees that we actually have today. So I think we've taken back a few steps in the fight for climate justice. And right now it's a question of whether the government is willing to jump back onto the wheel to fight for climate justice, re-educate the people, relocate people from forests, um, have people planting more trees because now planting trees, the people I know planting trees, the different companies we've seen planting trees, actually planting trees for sale. Therefore, it's no longer about preserving the environment rather than a business in itself. So where do we stand as a country is a question that we are all asking ourselves because right now we have seen that we need much more work to be done. And even the idea of climate justice has changed because when you're looking at the SDGs, it's no longer just about how many trees have you planted and uh, how many swamps have you cleared because, of course, we should credit the government for you know, displacing people from the swamps and uh, the wetlands, but still, is it really enough to achieve the goal that is necessary? And secondly, are we going to look down at the motives unto which the government followed to relocate people from the wetlands, or are we going to still claim that this was in fight for climate justice? So there's a lot of speculation going on about what the government should or should not be doing, but what is actually the reality is that we are not in that fight anymore, at least not for the past three years. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Ricky. Um, let me bring Madrin into this discussion. So Madrin, we are talking about uh, climate justice in a country that has a very high poverty rate. So uh, my question to you is that how do we promote climate justice in a country where the poverty level is very, very high? For example, when you look at, let, let me talk about uh, issues of charcoal that Ricky just brought up. When you look at the people who sell this charcoal, are people who live below the dollar line. So how do we balance this? How do we promote climate justice in a country where the poverty level is very, very high? All right. Uh, once again, the issue of promoting climate justice in a country where the poverty line is you know, very high is actually you know, one of the most, I think one of the conversations which women should have had earlier, because, you know, where it all goes wrong is the part of who is supposed to do what, like Ricky has said. The effort in the climate justice is one effort that should be taken on in unison. You know, when we sit down and start excluding this and this, or this, is, this one is supposed to do this, you know, all that becomes and endless blame them that at the end of the day, it's not what you address us. But then it's important to understand that when we're addressing climate justice, these are things that affect all of us. And if they affect all of us, that means for a country like Uganda, whose backbone is agriculture, then this becomes a very urgent matter that should be addressed. Because, well, as we depend on agriculture, it's also important to identify that many of our young people, what I would call the you know that where the, the able-bodied young people, 
the youth still depend on this sort of agriculture. So the best way to tackle climate justice is by putting these young people in a position to know what they will have to lose. When we consider one of the, when if we consider agriculture, you know, it's the backbone. But then we are looking at things that affect it, things like adverse climate change. You're looking at things like drought, things like floods, things like landslides. Even if we were to look at livestock, you know, one of the floods that happened in Karamoja and took away like over a lot of like livestock. You know, at the end of the day, these people should be in position to know what is going to happen. You know, at the end of the day, because with climate justice, we are looking at already these small sections of people that are at the end of the day going to get the you know the magnitude the great magnitude of their failure to you know realize the climate justice so in this particular point in time this is where we should say like in a country like uganda we should give people this sort of you know people should be in a position to know that this is a fight for all of us then if all of us are engaged in this sort of fight and let me say the youth, let me say the elder, everyone knows and everyone is aware that this climate justice is a fight for all of us because the impacts affect everyone. Then we are going to be in a better position to what we are going to be in a better position to start evaluating what are going to be our choices when it comes to things like fighting poverty. Well, it will be, what if I farm better? What if every time I'm doing this, maybe I put up a tree, I grow a tree, I have like three trees over, around, this at the end of the day is going to look at bettering, let me say microbes that I would plant, because you know at the end of the day, these trees are going to better the environment going to fight some sort of global warming they're going to put up you know at the end of the day contribute to the rain cycle so then people should be in a position to have this information at their disposal because it benefits them at the end of the day and then it even looks at at the bet at, at the end of the day bettering if their poverty might be bettering them because someone will plant a tree as they plant their crops you know the agriculture is going to flourish and this is what we're looking at and this is what we want Okay, um, thank you, Madrin, for logically looking at, at that question. So moving to Jerome. Jerome, I would like to um, ask a question that is related to what I just asked Madrin, and it is something that I asked the previous group as well, because I feel we should get all your perspectives in this. It is a dilemma between if promoting development and then promoting uh, climate justice, a dilemma that we have found ourselves as a country in several times, where we see industries being built in wetlands, uh, forests being given to plant sugarcane and so forth in the name of industrialization and development. So my question to you is that um, first with a decision, whether to choose development or to promote climate justice as a country, which way do you think we should go? Uh, would you come again with a question? Oh, okay. My question comes from a dilemma that we have found ourselves in as a country several times. The issues of our development on one end and then climate justice on one end. Uh, we have seen where on the side of development, um, wetlands have been given on several occasions for industrialization, and even uh, forests have been given out uh, in the name of planting sugarcane still for industrialization. So my question to you comes from that dilemma. Uh, given um, that dilemma, if you're in position of authority, do you think as Uganda, we should choose development over climate justice. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, wow, that is really tricky. So if I'm faced with a decision to choose between development or climate justice, which one would I choose? <clears throat> Honestly, I would choose both. Reason being why I, would, why I would choose both is on the basis of standard, 
development development goes hand in hand with climate justice and climate justice goes hand in hand with development if i'm to pursue climate justice i'm going to destroy development and if i'm to choose development i'm going to destroy the stand i've been using for climate justice so the reason why i would choose both is in a basis i'm going to try to incorporate development with climate justice now take it for example if someone is destroying the trees for uh, the, the, the the plantation for sugarcane is uh, that that is that is detrimental that is disastrous for our climate justice instead the solution should be is that if we are planting this these are uh, if we are planting these sugar canes in this kind of part of this then we shall we are going to also incorporate trees along that same land that you're, pl you're planting if you decide to cut this forest plant trees also alongside them in a way is that you're, you're protecting the trees themselves at the same time you're trying to also protect the development within themselves and also when you try when you also decide to do development development also runs in hand with technology and the technology that we are having throughout throughout that i imagine also move hand in hand with development and climate justice take it for example if we're destroying trees to provide a kind of bio biomass and a, a bio kind of stand instead we should use our, our innovative minds or creativity within ourselves as people have done to bring in solar panels or solar also that solar kind of uh solar kind of devices to provide light to provide energy but we don't have that kind we have not reached to an, a point that we have been able to develop something that is going to be very very minor to even the low cost person should be able to what to, to be to able to so a low cost person is going to be able to own to cook food not yet but if we are able to incorporate that development or incorporate that technology where we are able to provide for some, we are able to develop something that, uh, let's say, a solar kind of cooker that even the low cost, a person below a standard dollar can own and use, then we, we are able to prevent, we are able to promote climate justice. At the same time, we are managing to, to avoid the destruction of forests and enabling development because from development, we can be able to uh, mitigate climate justice. Even development itself, uh, if we're to build up industries, we are, we are supposed to know which industries we are we supposed to build and where are we supposed to build those industries and what kind of chemicals are they going, or which kind of, uh, which kind of detriment are they going to do to the environment? Do that analysis. Nema normally does that in, in kind of in, 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 the, in, the, in the future run, but we don't have the enough, we don't have enough technology or, or innovations that can actually stop us from miti mitigating that kind of development. Uh, so if we had that kind of innovation and uh, if we had that kind of innovation that is already there, but still bottlenecked, we could what? We could actually do both. But in this, our current stand right now, in, uh, that is just speculation for my own side, but our current stand right now, if I'm to make that decision, I would go for climate justice because it is something dire and it's going to be affecting us on throughout our entire lives and we need, it needs to be worked upon. We need to build, we need to come back, put our friends back. We need to put everything back to where it was, to way to a situation that we can develop ourselves better when our climate is already, when our climate is back to the way it's supposed to be, where, where we are experiencing a level that the, the crops we are growing is going are going to be developed in the way they have been. You've noticed that the, the seasons are changing, floods are coming, heat is coming generally from even months that are not supposed to be producing heat. So currently right now, I would choose climate justice, but under speculation, I would choose both. Thank you. Okay, we can see uh, Jerome who um, wants his legs to be on both ends of the discussion. I see Ricky's hand is up. So yeah, Ricky, you have the chance to have your input uh, into this discussion, especially this question that we just posed. Now, um, to add on Jerome's idea is that we, uh, he says that we need to provide what the people need. And I'm thinking uh, what can be done is a general scheme of uh, events. How do we provide what is most needed to the people so that we can avoid or actually subsidize on the course of us losing out on ideas such as uh, climate justice and also combining the idea of emerging technologies and also putting in a little bit of the, of the perspective of digital rights. Because I think these three are connected in a way that, uh, one, if 
if as a country we need provision of uh, power, uh, for example, to cook, uh, power that is an alternative from that usual or the casual use of charcoal, how do we provide this at a larger scale to everyone within the safety, uh, within the safety limits of our function? For example, are we going to, uh, he mentions about solar and I've seen, uh, I was reading about the idea of solar and I've seen that countries, for example, um, sorry, states like California in the United States, which is far-fetched, but still, um, these states are states that have incurred the use of uh, solar at a large scale because California is partly a desert and therefore provisional sun is not really a problem. Therefore, how do we use our resources, our natural resources, for example, the sun, uh, whether we are tropical climate, we are a tropical country, therefore we are in very much provision or abundance of the sun itself. Therefore, how do we harness the power at a large scale and provide electricity to use for each and every individual so that we can eliminate the use of charcoal? Even in the rural settings, so I'm feeling that everyone's concern right now would be that with the use of solar, the people in the rural areas can they afford. And I'm saying if the government looks at the cost benefit of the idea of trees or charcoal versus solar, I think in the longer and or on a larger scale, every, um, we are lowering the cost on provision and also we are lowering the, uh, we are also advancing climate justice in the world, fighting for our forests, fighting for the trees, and also fighting for what the, the SDGs. So I think that was my small submission in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ricky, for that addition. Uh, let me bring Edgar into the discussion that I know he has been waiting for since it reminds with your course. So, Edgar, my question to you relates to issues of international law and uh, climate justice at international level, looking at the complexity of implementation of laws at an international level where we even see some countries are implementing laws on climate justice, other countries are reluctant. So my question to you is how do we promote climate justice at an international level? Okay, um, thank you. So let's start from the international level. I think recently, I think last year, there was a conference, COP26, where there were discussions on climate climate financing and climate mitigation and all that. But there was a very big problem. And one concern was that there is limited implementation from the countries. Like for instance, the countries will go there and decide that it's time for us to outphase coal, right? You know, but then later on, uh, due to some bargaining from big powers in, in like in oil sector from companies like Shell, then they come to a resolution that you know what, we cannot outphase coal, but I want to do, we are only going to, to downphase it. So now they narrow the discussion from outphasing coal to downphasing coal. But now, even when they narrow it to downphasing of coal, in practice, these same companies, the BP, Shell, and ETC, continuously go on to exploit uh, uh, you know, our natural resources, our natural gas and oil in countries like Uganda, right? You know, recently, it was just, I think, a few months after the COP26 uh, conference, which was, in, um, I think, in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and just a few months later, that's when these companies are now signing uh, the, the final investment decision in countries like Uganda. So it is true from that background that there's a, a lot of very many issues. But also, most importantly, what I think should be the core before we even discuss the international law is whether, on the question of development versus climate justice, whether this is really should be a concern so much for Africa. Of course, it should be because the, the effects of climate change cut across, they're global. Yeah? The fact that when one country releases fumes, even when in your country you don't release fumes, the impact of those fumes will reach you. It doesn't matter whether you gather, you plant trees and you do everything, as long as in some country, their fumes are continuously rising, you will still suffer the effect. So that is enough for you to uh, be cautious about climate change and continuously establish international um, kind of adherence 
because individual Harris as a country is as good as useless. So, uh, of course, that's if the other countries don't cooperate in the same line. And that's why international uh, law has to be important. Um, However, as you noted, international law still has a problem. The fact that it's only based on the goodwill of the member countries or the member states that ratify uh, to those treaties and ETC. But um, so, but also I think what the major problem is, 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 is on context, yeah? Because for a country like Uganda, a country like Uganda will tell you that we won't prioritize climate justice, we rather prioritize development. And I find them to be justified. Why? Because you need to understand that all these countries that have developed where they are, there is not any country that developed by fast establishing or becoming friendly to, uh, to the environment. They all exploited their oil. Right now, even the US still has the biggest storage of oil in the world. And it is the same country that is preaching climate justice and the down phasing of coal, yet they have uh, like the largest uh, oil reserve in the world. So for what? Do you think they're going to destroy that oil? Definitely they're going to use it in the next future. Then the question is, why should a country like Uganda also not exploit their oil? They definitely won't accept that when they see you, the US, the superpower, who is preaching um, climate justice at CTC, you're storing the largest reserve of what you consider as toxic and as something that should be down -faced. But number two is that these countries need it. They need them, these resources to develop because in all other uh, economic spaces, it is see they are failed to compete, perhaps with corruption, perhaps because those kind of models are just bought from the Western institutions and ETC. So there is need for them to exploit their natural resource and be able to survive on it. So the question therefore shouldn't be on whether these countries, and this is in, and, and, and this is in line with the international kind of concept, so the idea then should not be as how it was resolved at COP26 on how we are going to down phase, um, you know, investments in, in, in coal and oil production. I don't think that is something we can accept as a country and I'll support my country. The conversation instead should be on how to ensure that while exploiting your natural gas and your oil and ETC, you make sure the environment is not harmed in any way. Or that should there be any harm in the environment you ensure sufficient repercussions to that end. That's what the conversation ought to be. And unfortunately, this is kind of conversation that does not happen at COP26. All the resolutions were as simple and as plain as that. One, they were ambiguous, but beyond that, they would not fully align within our context of need to exploit those natural resources. And as such, they remain ones that are just on paper and hard to implement. Because in reality, the priority of our, of, the, of our governments, for instance, would have to be different, they must be development. And therefore, the question then is, is there sufficient technology or are there ways for us on how to mitigate um, um, you know, like those impacts? Of course, there is. For instance, before you, find, before you sign a financial investment decision uh, for oil production, which was um, recently signed in Uganda, they, you must first undergo what they call an environmental impact assessment plan, where they look at what are the possible challenges that will come with your drilling, with exploration, you know, how is it most likely going to um, affect uh, the biodiversity, you know, and so what are your mitigation measures? We consider all that on, on, on people in terms of displacement, on, the, um, you know, on, 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 on the dreams and environments, the microorganisms in the land and ETC. So those are things that we need to focus on. Ensure that, for instance, for such a project to happen, there must be an environmental impact assessment plan. And these must start from individual countries. I think we need the international law to give us an international framework because the impacts are international anyways, but the implementation must be individualistic. That within your own context, you must still be able to play a part to mitigate, or at least, um, you know, a cut off those kind of fumes, which I think our countries are trying to do. And now, however, on the challenges like um, of, 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 of things like, like, in, like using wetlands, uh, you know, for, for, for industries, I think this is something that should be punished, you know, severely. So what I would question on that regard is that we don't even have, um, I think, really big penalties Maybe they are there by the law, but in reality, we don't see these people being persecuted with extremity for us to have um, like some lesson. 
which I think should happen, right? But beyond that, I don't think, for instance, you need wetlands. There is enough land for you to build your industries that is not wetlands. But beyond that, after you building these wetlands that could definitely release fumes, there is still enough technology for you to do carbon trapping, for instance, so that those fumes are not released in the environment at a certain disastrous uh, kind of, uh, uh, of, 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 of of that threshold. So I think these are things that we need in our policing as a government that we currently lack. The policing is a little shaky. But beyond that, there are also we need more investment in things like green economy, um, you know, for, uh, for instance, I recently remember my last year, in my last year, my research for third year, as, as able to manufacture roofing tiles from plastics. Yeah. So I would use the normal polythene bags and this paper and plastic bottles to manufacture roofing tiles and floor tiles. Perfect. And they're even more durable than the normal ones of ceramic tiles. So I think such kind of, of innovation and investment uh, in the green economy is one we ought to envisage and practice and uh, as a way to manage the waste that we already have, but also as a way to deal with the reality, because sometimes it may be really hard or impossible to allocate plastic. So then the question should not be on you going in, in, in those international conferences and making resolutions that won't be easily implemented, but rather on perhaps also using that waste to a good advantage. So I think there are such alternative solutions we ought to envisage, but I think the question of context is very important as international level, but also the answer of what happens to a country that decides to continuously do, uh, do deforestation, for instance. There is no provision for that. I think we need to reinstate um, like how it was in the in, in the total protocol, uh, you know, the carbon quota kind of a system. I think maybe that would help on that. It was a good way to punish countries that decide not to um, to have some effort towards climate action. So yeah, so I think uh, such a gap that we need to address for us to be able to deal with this at international level. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Edgar. That was quite elaborate. Um, Ricky, I would like you to conclude on this topic of uh, climate justice. And uh, my question to you is, where does the youth come in? What role can the youth play in promotion of climate justice? OK, um, let me let me uh, throw that question to um, Madrin. So Madrin, looking at the youth um, who are the main focus for our discussion today. So where do they come in? What role can they play to promote climate justice? I think the role of the youth in this, in the promotion of climate justice is one that should be considered at a greater extent because, you know, climate justice always comes back to whatever you do. It doesn't matter if you're youth or anyone, but particularly let's just look at the youth because the people are under discussion right now. That let, let me let me consider the youth as, you know, the, the, the target group and you know the point of the, the gist of the matter. You know, with the youth and their numbers, potentially, you know, they, they can if if they are you know if they are involved in this, they can have, you know, at the end of the day, they can do very good things. For status, if every youth out there was in a position to maybe a day or let me say like a week or in their schools or wherever they are, could at least put a plant out there, or put rather a tree out there. You know, with uh, I think it's over 75% of our population being youth. You know, that is already a promising, you know, initiative in this fight to climate justice. But secondly, what if, <clears throat> what if these youth, like Edgar suggested, you know, these youth, you know, have thought about all these better ways, like he himself, a youth told you, he looked for a way of making better tiles through the polythene that these guys actually, that these guys are manufacture, manufacturing and they actually, people are actually dumping on the ground and it's polluting the entire ground and everything. You know, if these youth could, you know, be motivated to venture in such positive things like utilizing the polythene bags or to do better things like that, then I want you to envision if 75% of our population engaged in that, where would we be? You know, that is already potentially promising to all of us. So I say that, that I say in this particular fight, the youth have to take it upon themselves. But of course, it can't be 
an exclusive effort of looking at only the youth. And it has to be in partnership with other people, with other brackets like Edgar say, this is a global thing. If a Ugandan youth has seen this is going to help them, because at the end of the day, climate change is the driving force behind everything we do, behind the productivity, behind creation of job employment for a country like Uganda that dwells on agriculture. So this is quite promising if these youth, a Ugandan youth, can engage in this. But then, what if also a youth out there in any other country in Zanzibar in, in Mozambique can also pick up the mantle and follow these people. You know, this is entirely going to be promising for a continent like Africa that has the youngest population. So still our cry and my call out to the youth out there is this is our initiative, but as well as it's our initiative, we can better innovate in ways that look at prioritizing climate justice as well. It should be you know, it should be an, a priority for the other people in other age brackets to help us in this fight. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Let me give Ricky a minute to um, give his input. Thank you so much, uh, Madrin. But now, I think what can be added to Madrin's submission is the idea that we need to recognize the relationship between technology and humanity. It is basically the youth who are very, very much acquainted with the use and the uh, functioning of technology. And as well as we've seen in such a country, there is prioritization of uh, understanding and labor and also availability of resources. And we've seen that most of the resources, especially those that are needed within the ideas of technology advancements, um, emerging technologies, digital rights, most of these things fall under the purview of the people who are not necessarily the youth. For example, uh, legislators, these are members of parliament, most of which are above 40. That means they are not necessarily the youth that we should be looking at. But they do have the power. They do have the resources. Therefore, merging these two parties together under a similar goal or under the same goal, that is advanced technology that is both safe and productive for our economies and us as a country, then I think that would be the way forward to go. Secondly, we have seen that the ideas are emerging necessarily from the youth because why? The youth are currently within education. The youth are more on social media and have learned how to use it. Some are using it for good and others are not necessarily using it for bad. Third, the youth have room to change and grow and to learn and study. Therefore, as we say, it is necessarily their mantle to carry on the ideas of pursuing technological advancements but they cannot do it alone. We need the older generation to tap in and also provide the necessary resources and also the opportunities to learn, opportunities to lead other youth, opportunities to be exposed to the entire world and as to how the different people have used it. Because we've seen that Uganda has borrowed a leaf from the Netherlands, which is being currently known as a lead in, in the way they are doing their agriculture, even within the limited resources that they have. And therefore, borrowing that knowledge in a country like Uganda is very fertile and very, very, very much blessed in the ideas of agriculture, then we shall be doing ourselves a good service. Therefore, merging the two, I think, is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky. That concludes our discussion on climate justice and concludes our debate for today. I would like to give the panelists one minute each to give us closing remarks. And I'm going to start from uh, the gentleman who started the discussion, and that is Edgar. So Edgar, you have one minute to close. Oh, okay. Let me uh, move to Madrin uh, as we wait for Edgar. So Madrin. All right, thank you very much. Uh, to sum this up, I think the topics in the discussion are quite not, uh, I can't say they are mission exclusive. These are topics that share a little in common. So it's important to know that looking at the driving force, which would be at the middle like technology and the emerging technologies, it's important to understand that it will work hand in hand with the digital rights and with the climate justice. So in our quest for development, let us not forget that we still have to develop and live in this world. So let us also look at the bit of climate justice. Let us look at a major point where these three can exist and coexist for us to have better results. And in everything we do, and, and as we are questing to do this, of course, let us prioritize the the pot, like the potential, like that, you know, that particular target group, the youth, who are many and are quite energetic, innovative, and they can participate in all of those things. Let us 
put for them the platforms if it's the government, you know, to access the driving force. And at the end of the day, let us look at maximizing their potential in all these different endeavors. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Madrin. Let me move to Jerome. Uh, okay, uh, amidst all our trials and temptations that we, that we uh, uh, experience within our lives, let us not forget that however much we are experiencing a lot of uh, new technologies coming out into our world, we are supposed to learn to synchronize with them and take out the good, not the bad with them. Uh, the digital rights given to us, let us try to sync and incorporate with them and leave and let us uh, learn to accept what is there and then remove what is not 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 valuable enough for us and try to stand up for ourselves amidst all our restrictions and we can manage to build up something better not forgetting that <clears throat> not forgetting that climate is something that occurs throughout all our lives it affects us health wise uh, economically even politically. So we should all work together towards a standpoint, use the different technologies we have, the voices we have, the influences, the influence we have in our various sectors, be it social media, be it in power, be it, be it, in, be it in anything, as long as you can influence other people around there to join in in the fight to fight climate change so that we can be able to develop ourselves amidst our climate change situation. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Let's get closing remarks from Ricky. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Jenda, for facilitating this discussion. Uh, in my closing remarks, I'd like to point out the idea that in order to achieve emerging technologies for the betterment of this country and the betterment of the individuals, we do need to keep ourselves steady and also alive at least for the next 1,000 years. And that cannot be done without climate justice. And in order for us to achieve these emerging technologies, we cannot do it with restrictions in digital rights. Therefore, the three parties need to be brought together and harmonized. And who has the power to do that? It is within our state, it is within our government, but also it is within us as the individuals. If we have ideas, we cannot sit on them. And I speak for the youth, we are willing to actually do these things. We have seen, the country has seen us do innovations after innovation, and the country needs to step up and give us a supporting hand because we also acknowledge that as the youth, we do not necessarily have the resources to sustain our projects. We do have the ideas, but the resources are also slated within a different demography of the population. And that is in the older generation, as we have seen, they have the power, they do have the resources as well. Therefore, they need to come down and also understand what we need as a country. But then also on a bigger scale, we do not necessarily just need to advance the technology that is going to be helpful in the agriculture sector or just in the sectors that benefit us as a country. But I think we also need to market ourselves as a country that is very self-sufficient. In the ideas of self-sufficiency, we are looking at uh, what can we do to support the communities within us. In as much as we might not be helping them to grow more food, but are we making their lives better? Are we subsidizing on the standards of living with our innovations? That is the way to go. And secondly, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is already invented. And that is something most people think is no longer, we need something new every single time. But I think even in the old, even the already existing technology, I think what is necessary is how do we twist it to fit the narrative of us as Ugandans in our state? How does it help us become better individuals? How does it help us grow more crops? How does it help us earn more? How does it help us make the standards of living cheaper? And how does it help us protect our citizens better? Because the ideas of cyber crimes or cyber harassment are real. Child pornography is real. And it is also active within this very country. We do not speak about it much, but it is happening. Therefore, how do we use this as the youth today 
to fight for the people who are being affected by these emerging technologies. Because one thing is clear is that we can no longer hide under the rock and say that technology is going to go past us. It is here and it is here to stay. And so also going to keep on changing. So for how do we adapt and keep and keep ourselves, preserve ourselves within our state of our social standing without actually compromising the etiquette that we have as a country. Therefore, these are things we need to consider as we look at topics such as digital rights, topics such as emerging technologies, and also topics such as climate justice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ricky. Uh, last but not least, let's have Edgar. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, good opportunity. I think it was good discussing uh, yeah, climate justice, emerging technologies, um, and, and the little rights. But I think, uh, as Ricky perhaps noted, there is a great uh, relation uh, to two issues. Uh, the only difference that you get as I end this is that it's important that uh, young people recognize the importance of climate and how they won't even survive without great climate action but also at the same time to be able to discern and not be used as puppets of radical activism against what their own reality ought to be. So I think that is just enough to that end, but beyond that, that we can also innovate and be able to defend our digital rights. And perhaps also young people can find ways of standing with, uh, with bodies like Uganda Law Society, in case of any challenges that uh, they have been making in the past, like to Section 25 of the Computer Misuse Act, so that we, uh, we see those kind of, of liberties are uh, given to us because we deserve them as part of the law. And I think that's those are kind of spaces we need to get into. But also, it's needless to say that you can't be a youth in such a society and not think in the ways of the future. And the only way to do that is to emerge. Uh, politically to emerge uh, socially, but for this today's discussion, that entails us emerging um, uh, technologically. So you definitely have to contribute. Otherwise, thanks so much. It's been such an insightful uh, deliberation and discussion. Um, very proud to have participated in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for today. Uh, the debaters from Bara University of Science and Technology. I really appreciate you people for the very, very well deserving, well researched, and um, very good discussion on digital rights, emerging technologies, and climate justice, and specifically what role the youth play in all this. Thank you so much. Today, we have been uh, having a discussion with four debaters. Um, first, Debater being Mutungisa uh, Edda, uh, Ricky Mukume, uh, Nakulima, Denise Madrin, and Okelo Jerome. Thank you so much to these four debaters and uh, for having this very, very elaborate discussion. I would like to also appreciate Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV for organizing this discussion that is very fruitful. And our prayer is that uh, this discussion is able to create impact into um, people's lives and into this country, as well as the work that much, especially when it comes to topics that are global, such as climate justice. Thank you. And uh, from us, I would like to say thank you also to the viewers. And um, this, this, you can continue with this discussion on Twitter. Make sure you tag uh, Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV and let us, and also you can comment in the comment section and put your comments uh, about digital rights, emerging technologies, and climate justice, the role of the youth in all this. Our discussion for today has come to an end, and I'll see you again next week, same time. Bye. <laughs>